call the meeting to order. A quorum is present. Uh, Those that's messing around. Uh, Rip Tim Benson, make a motion to approve the February 19th minute. Mr. Chairman, I uh, do move the uh, February 19th minutes. Okay, uh, any uh, discussion uh, on the February 19th min minute? February 19th minute. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevailed. Minutes are approved. All right, members, there's going to be an addition, a, 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 a subtraction from the agenda. Bill number five that was posted. Uh, House file 162, uh, we are removing from the agenda. I have decided to remove that based on the fact that I had introduced today and was actually on the introductions today, House file 731, which has that exact same language in it, just as what occurred yesterday on the Russo bill and the Hansen bill. Uh, so what we're going to do is take the bill that just that has only the language in it, number five on the agenda today, and remove it from our agenda. And we will hear that language when we do House File 731. All right, so the first bill up uh, before us today is House File 436, Representative Wagenius. And Representative Wagenius moves House File 436 um, to be passed and re-referred to the Environment Committee on uh, Natural Resources Environmental Finance. Thank you, Representative Wagenius. And you have an amendment, the DE2 amendment. Representative uh, uh, Wagenius moves the DE2 amendment. Any uh, discussion on the DE2? Being none, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Representative Wagenius, two year bill as adopted. Thank you, members. Uh, this is essentially giving uh, the Pollution Control Agency both the authority and the direction uh, to. Uh, allow or uh, uh, say allow encourage uh, folks who are going to do new uh, wastewater treatment systems ask the state for revolving loan fund money to make those systems uh, either uh, re they're not making them have the opportunity to reuse water if you choose to do that this gives you a bit of a leg up in the priority system if you are going to choose the reuse option. And uh, so there's no mandatory. It is an opportunity that we want to encourage. And I think uh, one of the things that has happened this year uh, with the drought, it has exposed uh, kind of one of those secrets in Minnesota that we don't necessarily have as much groundwater as we thought we did and that in some ways we are going to have to change our habits a little bit. Uh, and one of the things I like to tell people about is in South, no, North Dakota, in Fargo, uh, they use their wastewater for an ethanol plant. And they literally put it in a pipe and send it 19 miles to the ethanol plant because they have finished it a little differently and now it is available for reuse. Uh, there's no mandate here. It's just encouraging uh, us to start to talk about this new thing that we probably need to do in Minnesota. Thank you, Rep Representative Wagenius. Questions from the members? Representative Fabian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative Wagenius, um, you say it's all voluntary and so forth, but what would what would be the downside? Um, uh, I'm just, you know, when, when we got the points and the uh, ranking systems and the project priority list, um, if, if you haven't done this, I mean, is there extra cost involved in being able to reuse water? I'm thinking particularly of some of our really small towns that already have difficulties with their systems. And is this going to put them at a disadvantage well, in the future? First of all, nobody has to do this. Representative Bulgenia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank this is a choice that a wastewater system may choose to do. And if they choose to do it, they will probably be selling their water. They will not be just saying, hey, do you want some water? Uh, so they will be selling the water that they produce. Representative Fabian. I understand that, but what I'm wondering about is the points. 
okay, the, they acquire these points, uh, and I believe it's 10 or 20. What was the number? It, it's 15. 20. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, what is the advantage for getting points? Mm. The advantage would be you would, uh, since we're trying to encourage this, you would go up in the queue a bit. If you were going to do this, we as a state would be saying it's a priority to reuse water so you get a, somewhat up in the queue. Yeah, Representative Fabian, if you were, uh, if you had an industrial user, let's use that as someone that was nearby your plant, and you had hot water to share with them, and you were going to propose to ma make your plant that way, and someone had 210 points, and you added the feature of uh, on the, and that's just an imaginary number that made up on the PFA list, um, <clears throat> or the WIF list, whatever the list you happen to be on, and this new system came in, that would actually rank the the system that used the hot water byproduct higher than the one that wasn't. Is that correct, Representative Virginia? And they would be rewarded by allegedly getting their projects sooner than than projects that did not do that. Is that correct? Okay, uh, Representative Cornish. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Virginia, I, I would just feel a little more comfortable if uh, this the man from PFA was here to tell us that it wouldn't affect, like my town of Vernon Center, 300 and some people have been really struggling with their system. And um, and then the uh, somebody from the League of Minnesota Cities or Coalition or something, if they could tell if it would, I see there is somebody here, if we could, if they could just assure us they have no objections or if it wouldn't put them in a pinch, that would be great. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Craig Johnson with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, the description that the chair gave for how this would affect priorities in the scoring process is exactly right. Um, the, every project that comes in for funding from the state is given a score. There's a number of criteria, and what you see in statute is only a small part of it. There, most of it is in rule. Um, we have only a couple points that are in statute. Uh, and those points are assigned based on the project and what its technical you know, abilities are, plus other factors like is it in an area where we're prioritizing dealing with a certain pollutant, is it dealing with a impaired water, things like that are all scored. This would just be one of the things that would get added on to that. Uh, to re answer those questions generally about how this affects, what it would do is if you're in a community that does not have this option, you don't have an industrial user that could reuse. Um, it really wouldn't be feasible for you to get these bonus points um, unless you could come up with some way to get it to them like Representative Wigini has mentioned. So it could potentially have some facilities that normally would have scored high enough to get points might have to wait to the next cycle to get it because someone could reuse and got the bumped ahead of them on the list. That's, that's the only negative that can come out of this. Um, as far as specific facilities, you'd have to ask the PFA and the PCA. I really don't have information on that. Uh, Representative Cornish, I guess in your community, if you want to get the extra points, you could build a spa there. Yeah. <laughs> or a hot tub or something. Yeah, it's worrisome, uh, actually, because we've been struggling with Representative trying to get Cornish. funding for months or years, I should say, and I've been, uh, they've been really coming up to me and pressing, and so I just, anything that would put them lower than what they are in the rating would really mm -hmm. trouble me. But. Well, Rep Representative Cornish, it, wouldn't make, it would effectively make them lower, but it wouldn't lower their points that they had. Right. Representative Clark, uh, you're new to our committee, newly elected. I first, oh, pardon me? Johnson. Oh, Johnson. Yeah. I'm sorry. Would you like to introduce yourself uh, uh, sure to I will. the committee, I... where you're from? Tell us a little bit about you, and then you have a question. Okay. I'm uh, Clark <clears throat> Johnson. I live in North Mankato. I, I represent District 19A, which is mostly Nicollet County along with parts of the city of Mankato and the, the east side of uh, the Minnesota River are heading north along the border of Nicollet County. Um, I work at Minnesota State University in a couple of capacities. I'm on leave from that right now, of course. And uh, that's my story. My question is, uh, how many points generally would a, waste, a successful wastewater treatment have to, to get funding? We have someone coming down now from the PFA. I believe, and they will be able to tell you that. And while you're at the table, uh, if you'd like to give your comments on the bill as uh, written, as amended, I assume you've seen the amendment. Yeah, that's we'll give yes. him a minute to review that. Uh, yes, Mr. Go ahead, Chair. Introduce yourself to the committee and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Jeff Freeman. I'm the executive director of the Public Facilities Authority. We're the 
essentially the infrastructure bank that manages the state grant and loan programs uh, to finance uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, the, the point system, the way that works, uh, well, Craig described pretty well how the points are assigned. Um, we currently, and for the last several years, well, the way it works is each year we establish a, um, our, our board establishes a cutoff line kind of so all of the projects above a certain point on the list um, that have projects ready to go to construction can move ahead and we'll fund those that are ready to go. That cutoff we've uh, established at 45 points for the last several years. We really try hard to uh, maintain that at a constant and predictable level because there's so much there are quite a few years for cities to develop their projects and get them ready for construction and we want that to be predictable so a city knows kind of where they're on the list and have some sense that the money will be there when they're ready to go to construction. Um, it's a little hard to know how many projects we would actually see come forward to, uh, to get these points. My guess is to start with there probably would not be a, a great number. Um, so in general my, I'm thinking there probably, you know, it may move some projects or it could move a project above up into that fundable range that was ranked lower if they add some features and, and work with an industry or something to, uh, to reuse the wastewater. It probably would not affect other projects. We'd probably try to maintain that 45 point cutoff. Um, that's sort of somewhat dependent or very dependent on future the federal and state equity that's put into the program to kind of keep us operating. But for the foreseeable future, I don't think it would have a great impact. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Freeman. We had a conversation the other day about another failed system in my part of the state. With this in place and so forth, um, would this help or hurt them? I mean, obviously, they don't have anybody that they can sell their water to, in, in essence, their wastewater. Right. What would that have done to this situation? Um, was it going to move somebody ahead of them? And we already know that there's issues there, but... Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Fabian, um, it, it would not affect or directly affect that community or others that are already ranked high on the list. They would stay in that fundable range and um, uh, we'd be able to continue to fund those projects. Um, over time, I guess if, if there were a lot of projects, um, you know, it could mean that we ultimately would have to raise that cutoff line. Um, currently, we've got two to three hundred million dollars of demand a year for these funds. The loan program has capacity to do about a hundred million a year. Um, we actually operate a little beyond that level, um, try to keep up with demand as much as we can. So over time, it could start to um, uh, affect our ability to, to fund other projects. But I don't really see that as a, a near-term concern. I think that the numbers will be fairly small. And I want to say that there will be, I mean, the idea of you reusing wastewater and treating treated wastewater as an asset that has value and can be used for other things, um, we certainly support that. And uh, uh, you know, so the projects that would get these points and move up on the list, they would be good projects to do. Representative Clark or Johnson, please. Hi, Mr. Chairman. One, this is naive question number one. <laughs> Uh, do all cities compete, all size cities compete for these funds, or is just limited? So does Vernon Center conceivably compete with, with Minneapolis? Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, all, the, the list has 341 projects, which is probably some, some cities have more than one project, but probably close to 300 cities on the list of all sizes, small to large. Um, but the, the priority system that PCA has developed in their rules really does a good job of um, identifying uh, 
projects based on uh, environmental and public health factors and so um, and, and small communities can rank high on the list if, if they have serious issues to deal with so it's not a it's not driven by population so they can fall high on the list as well further questions Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, Representative Wagenius, why did you choose 15 points? Why not 10? Why not 20? I'm just curious. Well, I, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have been having conversations with the Pollution Control Agency, and they are in a process of doing a rulemaking, and uh, <clears throat> they are the ones that have, uh, they have 20 points for the first of my two categories. The number one, they have 20 points that they would be putting in their rulemaking. What I am doing here is giving them the authority. They, they could do it without this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you if this, um, because they have very broad authority. So they could do it, but this does it faster and it would I will tell you it will save money because they don't have to do this huge uh, statement of need and reasonableness uh, because they have the legislative authority. The other thing, the other reason I'm bringing it, because I think this is going to get done uh, eventually anyway, uh, at, and at 20 points, uh, we have to have a discussion about uh, Minnesota and the need to reuse water in some places where we are short of water. I mean, we in in our committee, um, in, uh, we, of course, you know about White Bear Lake. You probably may not know that Worthington literally ran out of water. <laughs> and uh, we have other places in the metropolitan area. For example, we are um, have a good aquifer. We're using it too fast. And that's probably the situation in other places in Minnesota. We have good aquifers. We're using them too fast. This is a way to slow down the use. Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Wagenius, I'm just curious, though, the bottom line, why wouldn't we just let the department do this by rule? It seems like we might be trying to uh, micromanage their their thing. If, the, if this is a good thing, won't they just do it on their own? And then if we need to change it or they need to adjust the points, they don't have to come back and do it by statute. They would be able to do it by rule. Uh, what, what's the argument there? Representative Borghenius. Well, first of all, we, we all know about rulemaking <clears throat> and that it sometimes gets off track. And, <laughs> and we also know it's expensive. So uh, this is a way to do this part of the rule less expensively because the legislature will have looked at this and as a policy decision will have said it's a good idea that we reuse water. Uh, and that is one of the things that will happen. So, so those are the two things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, if, if, if PCA is here, I wouldn't, because it's their rule, isn't it, uh, Representative Wagenius? It would be their rule. Yeah. Mr. Cadell. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could ask um, uh, the Commissioner Kudelka, um in regards to this, wouldn't it seem that you could just do this rulemaking? And I actually really like the idea. I, I understand where people that are in the queue, and it sounds like the ones in the queue would stay in the queue. But going forward, this seems we, we do this, if I'm not mistaken. We, when we rerouted the line from the uh, uh, Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant from the Vermilion River to the Mississippi. We go by Flint Hills, and I believe they've tapped into that and are using that, if I'm not mistaken. Representative Osmond, I think, pushed for that, and I'm pretty sure they're reusing some of that water. Am I wrong on that? Mm -hmm. They're not shaking their head yes. I thought they were, so I got that wrong. Okay, maybe it was a thought that it'll happen <laughs> in thought. the future. <laughs> but anyway, because I think that line goes pretty close there. Maybe that was Representative Osmond talked about that at one time, but uh, Commissioner, if you can uh, elaborate on why, why, why don't we just get you doing it, and then why does it got to cost so much? Everything we do costs so much. Can't we just do it? Get her done. Mr. Kudelka. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, for the record, my name is Kirk Kudelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, we have been doing some internal discussions with PFA and ourselves. We have right now an open rulemaking for some changes on stormwater. 
and we came to the same conclusion that Representative Wagenius did that this is a good idea. We need to be doing this. Uh, currently in the point structure, there is 20 points if you are reusing for land application. So if, for instance, someone is doing this right now for irrigation and land discharge, they're getting points. We are looking to do the same that if you reuse the water and use it for industrial uses instead, which wouldn't be under that category, they would be treated the same. We do have open rulemaking. We could, our estimate is that we will be done by September of this year. Whether we have the <coughs> legislation or do it ourselves, I think we're going to get to this. We have the same goal here. Representative McNamara. No. <coughs> Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Kadelka, thank you. Um, permitting, when you're going to reuse water uh, in, in this case, what, 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 are, what are the uh, ramifications for going through the permitting process to reuse water? Mr. Kadelka, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, it will again dictate on what their discharge is. It's the end of the pipe of what's coming out will help dictate it. Whether or not a company signs up to use the wastewater will really depend on what the quality of the water is coming from the wastewater plant and what their needs are. We have seen it with the reuse beneficial reuse grant right now from the Clean Water Fund that the, it really does depend on the industry and the quality of water. That's going to dictate more whether someone's going to use it. Permitting is what that person or company does with the water is going to help determine its end quality in some regards. So that's going to drive more what the permitting um, issues are with re using re reuse water versus necessarily them getting it from a wastewater plant. Further questions from the members? Thank you very much, Mr. Pedelka. Anyone in the audience like to testify for or against the bill? I see no one. The uh, chair renews his motion, or Representative Wagenius renews her motion that the bill be recommended to pass and move to the uh, uh, Environment and Finance Agricultural Committee. As favor? As, yes, as amended. In favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, members. I think we're going to make some more discussions about what we can do still. Okay, Representative Dill moves that House File 585 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Dill, would you like to explain your bill to the committee today? <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. House File uh, uh, House File 585 came to me from several people in the. Uh, uh, community, uh, not actually from my district, that have talked about uh, the idea that people are out uh, doing other things in blinds, in ground blinds, uh, during the hunting season, uh, particularly rifle season. And that they have requested that for safety purposes uh, that we require an orange to be placed on. Can you, can you come over and hit the back? Uh, back. The volume? No, it's, it's squealing a little bit. Okay, uh, they have, everybody here, right? They have uh, suggested and asked, and so I brought the bill forward, and, and we're going to lay the bill over, and I just, uh, like the other day when we had a bill in here about the uh, uh, fees that would ultimately go to Representative Wagenius, I wanted to bring this up. It's a short agenda day. Bring this up and have some discussion. Now, I got an email from Representative Cornish a bit ago, and that's how he and I communicate on some of these bills, and I sensed that he would thought that this was something we didn't need, I'd like to hear from him on it, and uh, uh, then we'll act accordingly. We'll lay it over and uh, we'll talk about it and see if it's in the end game omnibus bill. I think Representative McNamara as well had someone contact him about this issue as well. So uh, that's the bill. It requires 144 inches of uh, red to be placed visible from all sides, uh, which in my intent is, is that the 144 inches would be divided in, essentially in four pieces. But the total amount would be the 144 inches required. Okay. Any questions for Representative Dill? Uh, Representative Garnish. Um, 
Mr. Chair, Representative Dill, you're um, I just go over some of the stuff that was in my email. I um, <clears throat> I don't even like all of it, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like wearing orange in the woods, actually. I'm kind of different that way. I like it in the archery season. We don't have to wear orange, but we do in uh, firearms and muzzleloader season. Um, the problem I see is with a lot of people in my area uh, pull out fish houses on skids. Uh, they use uh, chicken coops. They pull out on skids. They've got, I've got three ground blinds that are purposely all camouflage so that you can't see them. We shoot bow and arrow and shotgun out of there. And uh, I've, I just don't like a bill like this unless there's proven that we're shooting a lot of people are injuring. And I know we had uh, in the small game season and the uh, firearm season, there was some actual proof about woundings and killing, you know, unfortunate fatalities. But I haven't heard of many in this one. And this one is almost kind of like admitting as hunters that we don't know the difference between a symmetrical, uh, they're usually opaque or square. It's kind of like we don't know the difference between that and a human we're just shooting at things blindly and so it, I think it puts a kind of a bad light on us so um, I know I doubt that there has been maybe a mishap here or there but it's just something that worries me as having to I'd rather see less orange than more so that's my problem with it. Okay. Representative uh, Dill, do you have uh, somebody to testify? Yes, the folks from the DNR are up here. I'd like to hear their opinion on this. Okay, could you please introduce yourself for the committee, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, Rodman Smith. I'm the Assistant Director of Enforcement for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, as far as the um, representative or Chair Dill did approach the department um, about this issue, and, and like Chair Dill, the department has had uh, several phone calls from people that have had concerns about um, the popular, increasing popularity of ground blinds um, throughout the state, especially the, the all camouflaged portable ones that are easily put up, uh, you know, within a minute and somebody can be inside the ground blind. They're like little pop-up tents and um, they're not there one weekend and then they're there next and or they could be there one day and gone the next or that afternoon. So um, although we have not had any incidents recorded in Minnesota with somebody being shot or injured um, in a ground blind, um, there are other states. Uh, Wisconsin has a similar law, and so does Iowa. In fact, uh, this, this law is fashioned after those two states. Um, those two states, they don't, they, from what I could find, they didn't, haven't had any reportable incidents, but talking with my counterparts in those states that was brought to them by the public as well. Um, we have instituted um, some ground blind safety and best practices in our firearm safety classes to talk about this when we do have our kids. And um, manufacturers now, if you do buy some of these portable blinds, they are coming with a 144 inch square orange that you can put on them. And then there are several, uh, some aftermarket you could buy um, for your portable blind. So it is something that we're seeing trending around the nation that people are starting to uh, to use this blaze orange to identify these ground blinds that can be easily uh, put up and down so fast. So, okay, Thank you. Uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Dill, uh, is there a fiscal note with this bill? Representative Dill. I do not. I have not requested one. Um, I'm being some straight. <laughs> Representative I'm Fabian. Being somewhat facetious. We're going to have to buy tape measures for game wardens now. Well, Representative um, Fabian, you know that I'm the king of the of the uh, legislature when it comes to taking away <laughs> game, uh, tapes from game wardens. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty well known for that, and and I agree that this is something that uh, may be interpreted to be opposite of my normal procedures. <laughs> uh, Representative Bayan. I have a series of questions, Mr. Chair, if I may. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, my concern, uh, first of all, the 144 inches, is that combined total or is that 144 inches on each side of the uh, blind? Representative Dell? Yeah. So it's a foot by foot square on each side of the blind. <laughs> Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Representative Dill, uh, if if I, in good faith effort, uh, decide to, on my ground blind, put uh, fluorescent, or excuse me, blaze orange uh, material, and it only measures 11 by 11 inches instead of 12 by 12, what's the fine going to be? 
Representative Dill. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I defer to uh, Director Rodman on that, how I, uh, or to Rodman on that, but uh, I will put it on the record that uh, there's a conservation officer that I'm really familiar with, and I pass many laws <laughs> relative to his operation, and he's now retired. And if a conservation officer does that, I'll pass another law. <laughs> does Mr. Rodman Smith have a... Uh, did you get that part of it? <laughs> okay, so there's a recommendation here. We're, we're on the fly, and that's the reason I brought the bill before us. It's not something that we're going to pass out of here. But the recommendation is, is there? It says in uh, uh, 1.23d, a violation of paragraph B shall not result in a penalty, but is punishable only by a safety warning. And what I would do if this was a uh, something that we decided to go forward with, I'd move that uh, over so that it was the same in sub in line 2.1 and beyond. Representative it's a good, Fabian. Good, good catch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I'm a little bit like Representative Cornish. I do hunt out of a ground blind a lot. When I get there, uh, I usually take my coat and just throw it over the top of the uh, ground blind, and then I have a light vest on inside, so I have blaze orange on while I'm inside of there as well. I'm I, I don't know. I just I'm uncomfortable with all of a sudden having to mandate that now we we've got to go back and retrofit. Uh, you know, I own four different ground, ground blinds, and my kids hunt in them. Hopefully, someday my grandchildren will if they last that long. I'm I'm uncomfortable with this uh, personally. If we can guarantee that there's not going to be a fine or anything, I could maybe see my way through that. But um, I just think it's uh, the camel's <coughs> nose is under the tent, and until I see a need for it, uh, I'm. I have some real strong reservations about it. I appreciate, uh, you know, the fact that it's come forward, but I'm just not on board with uh, great enthusiasm. Who, Mr. Chair? Uh, Representative Dill. Well, I actually want to thank you for doing what you said because you've essentially done what other people won't do, and that's to put an orange vest over the top of your blind. And so you're actually, maybe not you're meeting the 144 square inches per side, but you're actually doing exactly what we're going to have to tell people to do, possibly, in, in terms of legislation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I thank you for that, and I think you've recognized then and validated the fact that we need this because you have already done it and said that you do it on a common practice. Now my question is, and something that I don't know the I don't know the answer. Now, uh, ask Representative Cornish: uh, When you are hunting a deer with a firearm, you have to have blaze orange on to specify the amount. But if you get in a uh, in a ground blind, Representative Cornish and you have the orange in on, as Representative Fabian has stated he does, you could be totally concealed in the ground blind, have the orange on, and not be visible to any hunter. Is that correct? Can you uh, hunt from a concealed blind that's camouflaged with camouflage and still be within your regulations? I mean, the purpose of having camouflage is so that other hunters can see you. Representative Cornish. Maybe a little please. I, you'd probably have to ask the warden next to you there, but I, uh, I'm not aware of any specific exemption that once you get into a blind that you can take your uh, blaze orange off. Technically, you'd probably have to still have it on in there. So. Well, Representative Cornish. Mr. Representative Dill. Well, I kind, of, I kind of thought that would be the answer, but I wasn't sure. Bad to ask questions and you don't know the answer, but since it's kind of an open discussion, I can take that risk, and I appreciate that. But I, I mean... Am I wed to this? No. no. But I just wanted to have, bring it here. It sounded to me. It isn't something I would do uh, with the current practice. I would do exactly what Representative Fabian did. does. Okay. Representative Uglum. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I own a ground blind, too. I, I use it for turkey hunting, and I've been using it for deer hunting every once in a while. And... I guess one of my biggest concerns, when I use the ground blind, uh, it's usually raining or snowing, or, you know, it's a good place to uh, at least uh, have a little protection from the weather, so visibility is always bad and, and things like that. But my concern has always been, here I am in the ground blind, and if some deer uh, happens to run across and I'm in the line of fire uh, with another hunter coming by, and um, he just, the other hunter doesn't know I'm there. And uh, that fabric doesn't do too much good as far as uh, deflecting bullets and things. So, um, I, I mean, I think hunters are pretty ingenious uh, in terms of retrofitting things. And a little Velcro and a little orange, uh, orange blaze orange uh, uh, fabric uh, would do the job. 
um, I guess it's really, I, I've, I've thought about that when I've been out there. You, for those hunters, uh, Representative Fabian, you know, you do a lot of good thinking in a, in a, in a deer blind. And I've, I've thought about that. I've thought about what if, here I am on the ground. I don't worry too much when I'm up in the air in my, uh, in my stand. But what if I was in the line of fire uh, and you're all camoed up? I mean, they're not going to see you. So I, I, don't, I don't really have much of a problem with it. Thank you. Uh, Representative, ba Representative Babian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, there you go again, Representative. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you, make, you make your decision then. You decide to put it on there. Why do we have to have the state mandating to deer hunters that you have to do this? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just not there with you. And I do it. Some days maybe my jacket doesn't go on there. But what I do have is I have orange trapper's tape that I tie into the little... Uh, things that come out on the corner so you can tie it down too and I and I use that but we got the big long streamers so um, I just don't want to go on the slippery slope yet representative Yeruso thank you mr. chair um, I believe they sell blaze orange duct tape so you could all make yourselves a flag that you could do that but I think that um, one of the issues is that the responsible hunter knows that he can identify, he or she can identify the other hunters in the woods because they're going to have blaze orange on. They know that they're supposed to look for that. And this will provide protection for someone against the tragedy of shooting somebody by mistake when they were unable to detect that that person was there in the situation that was described of a deer going past a blind that they can't see. And so you're protecting other people from contributing to that tragedy. Thank you. Representative Isaacson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think that if I can maybe answer a comment that Representative Fabian made, I think you're not protecting yourself from folks like Representative Cornish, but you might be protecting your folks from someone like me who's never hunted before and is out there for the first time, <laughs> right? Because not all of us are experienced hunters that way. And if there's folks out there that don't know what they're doing, you know, I think this makes a, a lot of sense. and. And uh, it seems like such a small, I'm not ready to, you know, jump onto the slippery slope bandwagon on that. I, I think it's common sense. And so I, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Dill. Well, <clears throat> I wasn't going to bring this up, but uh, I have uh, duck hunting blinds down on the Platte River in Nebraska. And the uh, duck hunting season, the prime flight of the duck season is over the weeks where the deer season begins. And the Platte River is loaded with white-tailed deer of giant proportion. And we have a 10-foot a long stick with a red flag on the end of it. And when we, we're out, we stand up in the blind and we're looking for uh, ducks, we put the stick up with the red flag on it. And when we see the birds coming down the river, we pull it, pull it down and take our chances, I guess. But I mean, there is a lot of shooting, particularly that open weekend in the Platte River. And I mean, it, technically, even if it were a stray bullet, you could get shot. Not that a stray bullet is fired intentionally in that direction, but we, we do kind of take, like Representative Fabian, take some mitigating circumstances. By, in fact, Representative Fabian, you are a great American and a great hunter. That you, you do all this stuff voluntarily. And the problem is, is when we get to the end of the game, we may not have everybody doing it voluntarily. And I noticed that uh, the representative from the Deer Hunters Association, because this bill is somewhat new, they nodded to me that they don't have a, uh, a position on this at this time. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Yeah. All right, uh, Representative Cornish. Representative, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Dill, you and I have had a, a good relationship of deleting laws or less regulation on case guns, this and that, because we, we, you know, leave it up to the sportsmen. So the uh, DNR has been keeping statistics on uh, injuries and fatalities for since time began, and if we haven't got a problem, I've just seen you and I work together just to keep our same direction and not pass a law unless there's a a proven need for it. So I'd sure appreciate it if you if you held it in committee forever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, does anyone else in the audience here to testify for or against the bill? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, Representative Dill renews their motion that House File 585 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Uh, we have now finished the agenda, so we stand adjourned. Thank you. Right.